people's experience and what constrains that. And part of, you know, before I did this research, I was thinking, you know, part of it is the kind of like the individualization of concepts of loneliness, the individualization in, in methodologies, the individualization in policy and all these sorts of things. Um, but there's something more than that, that I think is kind of like present in the research project. It's kind of like, you know, an arrangement that's competitively funded. It's, it's a transient bounded temporality where we come into people's lives and we leave. Um, and um, there's these con contractual relationships. And I think part of the challenge is not only thinking beyond uh, individualizing definitions of loneliness, but creating new approaches to researching those more expansive relational understandings. And all I can say at the moment is the project form kind of works against that. And, and what I'm doing at the moment is, is, is trying to understand um, different kind of like infrastructures through which we can uh, engage in research with young people collaboratively and co-produced, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I haven't got time to talk about them now, but I've got a couple of projects ongoing. So I'll look forward to telling you about them in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, James. That was such an interesting, creative and innovative um, presentation and project to start our session off with. That was great. Um, so next up, we have Sarah Wright, who's talking about loneliness in young adult workers. So I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Um, just... Can everyone see my screen okay? We're still seeing the outline. Oh, there we go. That's perfect now. Great. Okay. All right. So my topic is loneliness in young adult workers. And the reason we're doing this project is um, looking at the experience of work and trying to remove the individual and looking at the work context and saying how is the work context influencing loneliness in young adult workers. Um, so my research background is in loneliness in the workplace. So I'm going to skim over the first few slides because I think we've already had enough background of what loneliness is and what it isn't. But um, this project was qualitative in nature and some really, really interesting quotes have come out about um, the, the youth, the in terms of young people experiencing loneliness. And here's a quote from a retail worker. I'm seen as this figure in this role, but not as me. It's really isolating being treated as a nothing, like you as a person don't exist. So again, it's less about the individual and more about the context. What is it about the context that's driving um, the experience of loneliness in the workplace? Um, so we'll probably hear more about this as we progress, but loneliness is on the rise for young adults, and that's what's piqued our interest in studying it. Um, there's very little research on loneliness in the workplace. I started, I did my PhD back in 2005 and it's since become um, a topic of interest, particularly since the pandemic. But what we do know is that loneliness workers tend to have negative outcomes in the workplace in terms of performance and commitment um, and being approachable. The, the causal mechanisms of those are not quite fleshed out yet, but we do know that there is a correlation. Um, so we, my co-author, Tony Salad, um, have conceptualized um, loneliness as being the psychological pain um, of relationship deficiencies, which we'll get into that when we uh, look at the data. Um, and in terms of these higher risk factors for young workers in terms of them entering the workplace, particularly in the pandemic when social um, structures are not necessarily in place as they used to be. Uh, so we wanted to know more about the contemporary labour market and how it might be influencing loneliness in the, in the workplace and the shift from a workplace situation and the, and the increasing nature of work in terms of it being uh, remote or home working, particularly with the pandemic, and also uh, peace rate jobs in terms of not necessarily belonging to any one particular organization. So our research objective for this particular project was to understand the lived experience of loneliness and our research is very preliminary. So it's just a, a, a teaser, really. Uh, so we wanted to um, study loneliness and do qualitative research to understand the, the experiences of 
workers who identified as being lonely. So we screened uh, for ensuring that they were lonely to begin with. And we're, I'm from New Zealand. And um, so we're doing research in New Zealand as well, but my co-author is from Italy. And so we geographically isolated the data just to Western Europe to look at um, what might be going on for young workers here. Uh, so we used prolific in an online anonymous survey and most people would think, oh, you should do interviews, but because of the stigma of loneliness, I wanted to explore the, the idea that people might talk more if they weren't necessarily having to talk to someone. Um, and so again, it was, an, it was an experiment to see if this kind of way of collecting data would get rich enough data. And um, so far I've been amazed at how much people are willing to disclose on an anonymous survey. Um, so again, the participants took it seriously and they took 46 minutes on average to complete the survey. So they invested a lot of time. I mean, they were getting paid, but not much. Um, and so I was, their motivation seemed to be greater than just getting paid. Uh, so one of the most interesting findings have come out from the preliminary data so far is this, and it's a theme that I've heard come out today as well, that loneliness is not just about people, um, but the experience you have in that social context. So the first theme was, excuse me, fe feeling unheard and unseen at work. So there's this invisibility aspect. And there's a quote here, I'd like to be used at work and be comfortable enough that someone higher up would want to speak with me and like see you. And you're sort of actually having those conversations go in different directions. And then you realize that others at work don't really listen to you. So there's a lot, a lot going on in that quote, but it, there was definitely themes coming through about, individuals not feeling that they mattered in the organization and that led to lots of other experiences of not um, having meaningful valuable experiences at work uh, and you know going back to Jung way back in 1963 loneliness does not have to come from having no people about but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or holding views which others find inadmissible. So the idea that you can't be yourself at work or somehow you need to hide yourself. The other theme that came through from the data uh, was this idea of there being a social fabric in organizations and the young worker didn't feel that they belonged and they felt that they either didn't fit in for a variety of reasons or somehow they were disconnected or sitting on the outside of those social elements of the organizations. So the idea, and we've, we've heard this today as a theme too, is that social isolation is neutral. It might not necessarily be a problem, but one of the interesting factors that, interesting themes that came out of our data was the idea that these young workers did want to be part of the organization and did want to be socially integrated. So they yearned to be part of something, and which is what we heard about in the previous presentation. Um, but it was their sense of belonging was unmet. Um, and this could be, and we need to tease this out a little bit more detail about work practices that might inhibit social connection. So there was some themes around people not have, everyone's work break was scheduled at different times. And so no one could um, socialize during their work breaks um, or work schedules that meant that they couldn't develop relationships um, with work colleagues. Um, so the idea is that social relation, theme in the data is that social relationships at work were restricted in some way. Um, or two minutes left now. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so there's just some more quotes around not having anybody to connect with. And there was also the theme when, when individuals had doubts or uncertainty, there was no one to turn to. Um, so that was another theme. And the final theme um, was 
the automation and the individuation of work. So work, the work unit is the self and feeling a lack of self-determination about how one works because of the nature of the tasks that they were doing. Um, some more quotes here. Um, sorry, I had to rush through these, but overall, um, our preliminary data shows the experience of work and the work environment can influence loneliness. And we can look at it not just from an individual perspective, but looking at it from a systemic point of view at an organization. How is work structured? How are work practices enacted to influence loneliness? And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Another great presentation on a really important topic. That's really interesting. So next up, we have um, Emma Kirwan, and she'll be presenting on exploring loneliness and social isolation, young adults, a qualitative interview study. So over to you, Emma. Thank you. Yep. Can you all see that OK? Yeah, that's all great. Thanks, Emma. OK. Hello everyone and welcome. So my name is Emma Corwin and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Limerick in Ireland and I'm also a member of the Early Career Researcher uh, Loneliness Research Network. So today I'm going to talk through our study uh, Exploring Loneliness and Social Isolation in Young Adulthood, a qualitative interview study which forms part of my PhD. And just to note that we're still working on the results of this study, so unfortunately I don't have results for you today, but I'll hopefully give you some insight into our methods and our experience of involving young adults in the design stage of our study. And this research is funded by the Irish Research Council and it involves spunout.ie, which is a youth information website in Ireland. So loneliness or this distressing feeling that comes with the experience of perceiving one's social relationships as inadequate is commonly experienced by young people. And depending on how it's measured, there may be up to as many as 71% of young adults experiencing loneliness. But despite this, the research efforts to understand loneliness in younger populations lag behind those of older adults. So emerging adulthood is this period from about 18 to 25 years. That's considered a distinct period of the lifespan that marks the transition from adolescence to full-fledged adulthood. And it's characterized by developmental milestones, uh, cognitive and physical maturation, identity exploration, increased autonomy, and increased instability, all of which might place this age group at an increased risk for loneliness. So we know that loneliness is associated with a wide spectrum of negative physical and mental health outcomes, including but not limited to anxiety and depression, risk of suicide, risk of disability, negative health behaviours such as alcohol abuse and poor overall health. And both the high prevalence of loneliness in young adults and the evidence for its harmful effects both support that good quality evidence is needed on loneliness in this group. However, little qualitative research has explored loneliness uh, during young adulthood and the qualitative research that exists tends to focus on the experience of loneliness in specific groups of young adults such as those with type 1 diabetes or young adults who experience depression. So the goal of our qualitative study is really to generate in-depth information about loneliness in this group. And it invites young adults to share their views, perspectives and experiences of loneliness in order to firstly better understand the experience of loneliness from a young adult perspective, but also to identify what do young adults themselves believe causes and maintains feelings of loneliness. And I mentioned that this study forms part of my PhD and the results will inform the development of a quantitative study on the risk factors for loneliness in this group. And lastly then just to mention another uh, goal of ours was to involve young adults themselves in the, in the design stage of the study. And also in order to maximize the value of the young adult voice in our study, we also had goals related to open science um, including depositing the anonymized transcripts of the interviews to a qualitative data archive. So this is just a screenshot um, of the protocol which we devised and pre-registered um, on Open Science Framework. And we also published it in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. And um, really, I suppose, to bring, to bring qualitative research closer to the principles of open science in being as transparent as possible about our planned methods. So 
So in line with our aim to involve young adults in Ireland in the design of our study materials, we created a research advisory group from spunout.ie's youth action panels. And spunout.ie is a youth information website for young people, by young people, which really aligns with our goal to involve young adults in our study. So it's one out of have youth action panels that involve young adults from all across Ireland and their panels include ethnic minority groups and young Irish travellers and, and we hope to include these voices in our study. So in May of 2021 we met with some of the young adults and our aim in the meeting was to present them our study materials such as our interview schedule, our information sheet, our debriefing sheet etc and to ask for their feedback. And we found this a worthwhile experience and we received some really useful suggestions. For example, rather than calling the interviews interviews and um, to call it a conversation in our recruitment materials. So as to avoid intimidating young adults who may not be familiar with research. Uh, also, there was four of us on the research team, including a mix of genders. So we each wrote a short blurb about ourselves and so that interviewees could pick which member of the team they'd most like to speak to. And we found this worked really well. So to facilitate the fine balance of involving young adults in the research process, but without burdening them, we designed and released six monthly newsletter updates. And you can see an example of our last update um, in December on the right hand side. And we emailed these to our research advisory group, as well as posting them to Twitter um, to reach a wider audience. And when we held our second and last meeting with the group um, after we collected our data, we asked for their feedback on the project, on their involvement, um, and how to get the findings out there to young adults. And the feedback included that they found the newsletter updates uh, really useful to remain engaged with the project without having to take time out of work or university um, to meet us. So we provided participants with the option of taking part in a focus group with two other young adults or a one-to-one -one interview with a member of the research team. And the interviews seemed to be the preference. We, had, we held 27 virtual semi-structured one-to-one -one interviews, and you can see some of the demographics on the left-hand side. The young adults took part ranged in age from 18 to 25 years. And our interview schedule included 17 questions um, that included the following topics. For example, our first question was, what, was, what is the meaning of loneliness? Um, we talked about social comparison, transition points as being a, a point of vulnerability for loneliness for young adults. We talked about stigma of loneliness, uh, sex gender differences in both the experience and how willing a person may be to talk about loneliness, um, among other topics there. So I mentioned that unfortunately I haven't got any results yet um, to present to you today. And at the moment we are conducting framework analysis on the interviews. But I thought it might be nice to just give you a flavour of what some young adults responded to our first question, which was, what does loneliness mean to you? So I'll pop them all up on the screen so you can have a chance to read them. So loneliness was described by one young female as a sense of self. And other ways to describe loneliness emphasised isolation in that loneliness is being isolated and alone, both spiritually and emotionally. Or another person said when when uh, when a person feels like they don't have anyone to talk to about their issues. Other words used to describe loneliness included alienation, sadness, to a certain degree depression was used by one young male. And some young adults describe this perception element of loneliness in that loneliness is like being in a crowded room and feeling like you're on your own anyways. So lastly, then, just to finish up, um, just these are just out, the outputs and the planned outputs for um, at the project. So I mentioned already about our qualitative protocol paper, which is published in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods and is also um, uh, registered in Open Science Framework. Um, we got permission, permission uh, of all interviewees um, except one to publish their uh, an anonymized data set um, to the Irish Qualitative Data Archive so that other researchers who are also interested in loneliness uh, um, in young adulthood can access that data for their own research questions. And uh, we'll have a journal submission, which is to be confirmed. And then a key consideration of this project was disseminating the findings to a lay audience, for example, to young adults and maybe to NGOs or government departments who are interested in youth mental health. 
And um, so we plan to maybe do a, a video animation of, animation of the findings or a spun out.ie blog post, which details our partnership. But just stay for a minute left, Emma. Thanks. Perfect. I'm on the last slide now. So, um, so these are some acknowledgements just to say thanks, of course, for our young adult participants and our fantastic research advisory group for their time and spun out.ie for linking us up and then just some academics who helped us out with methods. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. That was a really interesting presentation and I'm really excited to see your results and the full results coming out later in the year. So next up and finally, um, but last but not least, we have Manel Lemonucci, and she is going to be presenting a narrative approach to students' experiences of loneliness, a social co-constructionist account of mental well-being in university. Over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. And can you see my slides as well? Yes, they look lovely and bright. <laughs> okay. So hi everyone, my name is Manal. Uh, I am a final year uh, PhD student from the University of Sheffield, England. And my work is on loneliness that uh, university students uh, tend to go through. So the title says, let's be lonely together. I know it's a little bit paradoxical, but it does have a meaning. And uh, so a little background about myself. I'm Algerian, Amazigh, North African. And I come from a community where we survive on community. Uh, loneliness is not even an option. Uh, it's not something we discuss, it's not something we talk about. I, I believe it does not exist in my own vocabulary in the uh, two other languages I speak. And so I came to the UK to do my PhD and I was introduced to a culture where people were afraid somehow to speak to each other. People were, uh, uh, were very scared when someone approached them and this especially happened in university libraries and university buildings. So I was looking for a research topic and I was interested in suicide because uh, I've, uh, I've, I've encountered the many news article papers where they speak about student suicide and it's usually uh, three lines uh, in, on the university newspaper website. And I thought uh, the student life should not wor uh, be worth only of uh, three lines on the newspaper. So I was thinking to myself, if we want to understand suicide, then we have to understand why would someone commit suicide? So I thought about depression and depression was still something to me uh, that was difficult to understand. So I thought about loneliness. This, this is why I'm doing my research on loneliness. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to have a very, very slow understanding of loneliness. And the qualitative approach allowed me to speak to people, to take my time and to understand what, what, what kind of life experiences they've been through, especially in university, to go to the point where they say I'm lonely. For me, I'm lonely was an end point. It wasn't a starting point. So I needed to understand what happened before for someone to feel lonely very easily in an in English university. So my research questions were basically, what are the students' experiences of loneliness in university? In this question, I look into the very private experience of loneliness, uh, what, words, what words they use to describe loneliness, what uh, images they use to describe loneliness, and uh, more specifically, the geography of loneliness in university. My second question is how is loneliness co-constructed in university? So in here, I look, in, I look into uh, students' relationships with their loved ones, family or close friends, and how come they feel lonely when you, when you are well surrounded with a, a good network of, uh, that provides you with great support. This is not the case for, with all of my participants, but it was the case for many. So it was an interesting theme to discuss as well. So for the research question three, I am looking at how are connections made or unmade on campus. So I'm trying to look at how come these people are friends and how come these people cannot be friends with this group. So I'm trying to look at what happens uh, and what kind of path do these uh, students walk to find themselves in groups, which is the ideal in university somehow. And uh, how come the others uh, start lonely on a path and end up lonely. So my fourth question is how does the structure of university influence or host the experience of loneliness? So I'm looking at uh, the structural, structural sorry, sorry, the structural aspect of university, and yeah. So uh, how does it uh, cause loneliness? How does it, in, sorry, how does it induce loneliness? Or and how does it counteract loneliness? So yeah, my methodology now. I'm using mainly narrative inquiry where we speak to people to listen to their stories, so we understand uh, whatever they are going through through their stories and the stories they tell about themselves. And in here as well, we look at how the master narratives uh, affect the way we tell stories about our life and how we counter uh, the master narratives by resisting the, uh, what's been enforced on us. So yeah, so I, I've spoken to 10 participants. They are both domestic and international students. 
I have six females and four males, and they are all from five universities in total. So I had two conversations with each. I plan to have four because my research is very sensitive. I didn't want to talk to someone and then leave them. So I wanted to, first of all, know how loneliness develops, how it recedes, how it comes back to on, on stage again. And at the same time, I did not want to leave them feeling lonely for a whole year. So I had this very perfect ideal plan that didn't work. So, so all, all I could do is two conversations with each. I also asked them to uh, send me images, uh, photos taken when they were lonely, if they remembered, and if they remembered me, the person who represents loneliness, and images shared from social media. So this is something that they would share on their own. Like, oh, like this looks like your topic, or this looks like how I'm feeling, or this has caused me to feel loneliness. And also there's one student who made a painting during COVID-19, which was, which I'm still struggling to analyze. So yeah. So the challenges, I, I had quite, uh, I had some challenges, especially with COVID-19, uh, because my data collection happened from November 2020 to, uh, sorry, 2019 to, uh, supposed to be, uh, to April 2020, and then Corona happened and my contacts disappeared. I had no university anymore and I had no classes, I had no seminars, no student union, nothing basically. So the university became this ha haunted island and the students uh, were going through an additional type of loneliness. Not all, but majority were, for my participants. So that was that. And that was me doing research on loneliness. So I had the ethical uh, problem of uh, talking about a topic that was so extremely painful, especially during COVID-19. And I was back home, fortunately. I traveled back to Algeria. And I wasn't lonely anymore because it was my starting point. And I had my family, I had my cats, I had everyone I needed to have. So I stopped talking to my participants because I didn't want to make them feel even more terrible. And I didn't want to cause them anxiety attacks because if you feel lonely and you can go out to have a coffee, it's different from feeling lonely and being stuck at home or in an accommodation with the news of death and all of that. So I stopped talking to my participants at the time. Uh, I was only checking up on them. So yeah, so then many students also returned to zero. So many of them ran away from home. They escaped from home to be in university and then they found themselves back in the same place that uh, they wanted to avoid in the first place. So my findings so far were, uh, first of all, the story of loneliness. Uh, I, what I found very interesting is that all people had words for the feeling, for the experience, but no one understood what it was. So they came to me to understand their feeling and I came to them to understand their feeling. So we were trying to co-construct what loneliness means. And also it was very personal in the sense that nobody knows about it. It's not just I'm feeling lonely because I am on my own. It's also I'm feeling lonely and nobody can know about that. So it's for me, it's two layers of loneliness. My second uh, theme was on, around burden. So many people were, uh, many of my participants felt like if they did share their loneliness with their friends or family that they were going to burden them. And uh, so they had the stigma around feeling old in a young body. So, so they were feeling like the, they felt like loneliness was a problem of the elderly. So that's why I think they, they felt stigmatized because how come you feel lonely when you can go out, make friends and uh, live the, time, the best time of your life in university, which I found which was very harmful narrative to uh, teach our students or, or just to share with our students. So yeah, and it's a feeling which induces shame. So I've taken the idea of ugly feelings from, uh, from Nige's work where a negative feeling induces another negative feeling and you are ashamed of something instead of trying to politically speak up around this topic. So it does uh, stand in the way of political activism to feel uh, negative about another negative feeling. Yeah, so the final uh, theme uh, which I was working on is groupings. So groupings, as I said in the beginning, was the ideal standard. It was the golden standard. So if you found the group, you are very lucky, you're very fortunate, you, you're more likely to have a really good experience. If not, then uh, you struggle and you always feel like you're lagging behind. And what I found is that uh, student societies were a place for loneliness, although they are advertised as place, places to be social. So many people go there to be social and they end up lonely. So how come you feel lonely in a social place? And then the feeling of uh, failure uh, intensifies in, and uh, gets magnified in these settings. So uh, SU becomes uh, the place where many people feel lonely, which even more lonely than they were. So groups were also the golden standard, as I said, and I use the idea of Berlant where she speaks of, on cruel optimism, is when you give people a, a promise of a really nice life, of a really happy life, and they try to live up to that promise, but at the end, uh, the promise is not, 
it's not guaranteed. It's the, it's the same opposite, uh, opposite. And then, yeah, so groupings also perpetuate exclusion. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to say that if you do group with people, you might be lucky and you might have your own people, but as well, you are, uh, you're not uh, opening the door to other people who might, who might feel lonely. So you are too focused on your own well-being that you forget that loneliness is an issue and you were lonely one day. So groupings, uh, I see them as more harmful than uh, helpful, to be honest. Yes. That. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so these were some photos that the, my participants shared with me. I, I would have loved the time to explain them to you, but this is some of the quotes. This is where when the student uh, said that she, she realized that she was so lonely when a yoga instructor uh, touched her uh, shoulders very gently. So she, she realized that she hasn't been touched in a long, long time, although she has been tried, actively trying to find a friend. The second one is about this uh, an international student who had a device that uh, he bought specifically uh, for times when he felt lonely. So the device speaks to him, but at the, at the end, uh, he realizes it's not a human being, just a device. And ways forward, uh, so for me to counter small acts of denial, because loneliness is you denying my existence, we have to, uh, we need some small acts of acknowledgement. Students can be part of that, and they need to be aware of that. So they need, they need to be aware of how they can help each other. And uh, lastly, university should consider investing in student mentoring programs because at least it guarantees some communication with other students, regardless of meeting or not meeting the master narrative of your great student experience in university, which is again a, a very wrong uh, <laughs> promise to give. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manel. Another really interesting presentation and fascinating to learn about how you cope with the challenges of the pandemic as well and your changing methodologies there. Okay. So we're coming to the end of this session, but we've got about 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion. Um, so if you could please use the raise hand function to ask a question that would help us with managing the questions. So would anyone like to kick us off? I was a bit nervous to get started. Oh, we've got one, Bridget. Hello, uh, this is a question for Manel. I was just wondering if you'd had a chance to compare your findings to perhaps some European studies. Like my son's traveling at the moment and he's with lots of European students. And he says that a lot of students go to university later in Europe than in our country. And I'm just wondering if that might impact the levels of loneliness that they experience compared to students in Britain. Yeah, well, I haven't checked to be honest, but I would assume it could be less bad because when you are uh, older going to university, you no, longer, uh, you no longer care about how others view you. You might care to some extent, but not to the same extent as someone who is 18. Uh, and um, I'm not sure to be honest about the other studies, but I know something for sure that uh, when uh, students from Britain go to France, for example, to study, they feel the same feeling an international student feels in, UK, in the UK. So they are also ostracized by the group. So I would say that there are some common patterns, but uh, I would assume that in Southern European countries, although groups exist, but it's, they are somehow warmer than the Northern globe of Europe, the Northern parts of Europe. So that, that's just an assumption. So I, I haven't had the time to read it deeply. Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Bridget. Alexandra. Um, Yes, actually, there's another question for you, Manal, because I'm really fascinated by this idea that we all have a responsibility to think about others, and that hasn't really come up in many research funding. So this idea that, you know, if we were all in person somewhere, and I went up to Katie and I thought, oh, I'd chat to Katie about her study, and then we form a little group, and then Manal and James are standing by themselves, and they're thinking, oh, I don't really know. And actually, as students and as citizens, we have a responsibility to, to go up to people and, and expand our own horizons. And I think maybe that's a life skill that students should be encouraged to embrace. The idea that when I go to university, I should make an effort to meet Bridget and Manel and not just hang out with Ellen and, you know, Siri, Lucy. So I don't know what you think about that, Manel, in terms of how we turn this into, you know, advice for students. And I'd love to hear the other um, breakout group presenters give their perspective if we have time. Uh, de definitely. So ethical responsibility is part of my, uh, I would say, recommendations because uh, because we tend to, uh, uh, this is something I noticed in the individualistic cultures, we tend to focus on our own well-being, on my own happiness, on my own improvement. 
but when once I'm happy, I, I would forget uh, automatically about the others. And I also forget uh, the times when I wasn't doing well. So I would uh, definitely encourage for university to do, to, uh, to actually do some courses to students to, to look after each other. And this is also something missing in uh, secondary education and primary school education. Well, primary school education, they are much nicer, but secondary school education, they start thinking about themselves only. And this is the mentality they take to university. And they don't care, honestly, they only care about themselves, whether it's negative or positive, uh, it needs to be changed. That's all, thank you. Do, do any of the other speakers want to respond to Alexandra's comment? Just about the institutions, just when you mentioned about doing more, I suppose, to um, help in that sense. We asked participants in our study, you know, what could, we talked a bit about transition points and specifically we talked a lot about um, moving to university as a really vulnerable period for loneliness and for young adults. And um, a lot of people said that, you know, those buddy systems, like although sometimes people roll their eyes at them, you know, this buddy system, that it actually is a real help. And it's something that can kind of combat that, I suppose. And a lot of people talked about how the first couple of weeks in university are really kind of make or break period where some people feel like if you don't make connections then you never will even though that's not necessarily true it's the perception I suppose that um so yeah I suppose that kind of buddy system was something that came up a bit in in, in my study. Um, I think one of the things that has come out about the research not so much in the left on red project but previous ones is, is the kind of like you know the kind of like you know, what is the frame of like social relationships but also kind of like the you know practices that aren't kind of like practiced I guess and I think one of the things we were thinking about is a kind of like a speculative thing where you know in um, the LGBT oh. the break no. up really closed I think suddenly Ellie, they did close without warning, so I didn't stop my recording. So what is um, the recording? I, I didn't close Maybe. the breakout room, so I don't know why I, that's happened. I'd suggest opening them again. I'll open them all again. Yeah. Everybody, sorry. We don't know what happened, but we're going to carry on. And James, you were in the middle of saying something. I wrote, what is the frame of social relationships in my tweet? Please complete my tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a way it's kind of like inventing new social practices I guess but you know one thing is kind of like you know the idea of coming out as, as a gay person was invented right so it's kind of like you know there's maybe we could think about like the idea of coming in and sort of like these kind of different kind of like practices that we could help people develop and I think the other thing that I'm interested in um, is kind of like rethinking um, what is the kind of like basis of these relationships is it individuals and individuals is it groups and I think the idea of like an emotional commons might be quite an interesting thing I'm part of a kind of um, Andy's Man Club, it's a men's mental health group. And it's kind of like, it's amazing for people who are uh, lonely, but it's not like an act of friendship. It's a, it's for two hours, people are there for you and they'll listen to you and they will be, you know, kind of present and all these kind of things, which is great. And then through that friendships happen, but it hasn't got the pressure of, we're all going to become best friends. And so I think it's kind of like, how do we conceptualize these things as kind of like, you know, relationships or commons or whatever else. And I think that's really important going forward. Thank you, James. Yeah, I think Alexandra as well, something quite interesting came out in my study, which we'll be talking about later today around, you were talking about I mean, what happens if I'm talking to one group and that excludes other people. The young people that we spoke to actually didn't like the word belonging at all because they felt belonging excluded other people. And it was such a, an interesting finding and something I really wasn't expecting because to me, belonging has quite a positive association to feel like, oh, I belong to a group. But actually the young people felt that if they belonged to a group, then it meant that other people didn't belong. So I think there's something about language as well and that responsibility about how we talk about involving people and including people in different group settings. Did anyone else have any further reflections on Alexandra's comment? Helen? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, thank you so much. The, these talks were intriguing and I, I, I really like this idea of sort of little acts of acknowledgement and I suppose as, as quite a few of us um, sits in the context of universities and a lot of, you know, what you talked about were young people and how hard it is to come to university. I just feel maybe we could devise some sort of programs in universities around these little acts of acknowledgement. Um, it, it's quite 
complicated how you actually socially engineer these things rather than that they are spontaneous. But I was very interested to hear about joining social clubs and so on, sometimes not feeling, um, not, you know, not alleviating loneliness. And it seems to be there was quite a lot of talk, if I bring it all together, about mattering and feeling that you are visible. The, the one about the workplace also, the sort of ideas, sorry if I'm not mentioning your names, but I, it's sort of all in my head together is sort of feel, feeling visible, feeling that you matter, feeling acknowledged. And I feel we could probably do something about that, uh, particularly post COVID where people are coming back with more mental health, more loneliness issues. Um, I just feel there's an opportunity here, but you know, I'm not, I'm, I am not don't know more than, than what I've said. I just think there's an opportunity. Yeah, I think that's so interesting that it's you know, more than being part of the group. You actually have to feel that you matter in that group and to be seen and to be heard. And sometimes we don't always take that next step. It's not just going to a group or society. It's got to be more than that. Um, really interesting reflection. Any other questions for our speakers? I'm hoping that I've got the timing right. I'm maybe a bit nervous that we left the room there, but it is till one o'clock, isn't it, Alexandra? Yes, I think so. Yeah, so we've got eight minutes. Go ahead. Um, Bridget's got a question, actually. Bridget? Yes, but I've already asked a question, and I know Dragana hasn't. Mine was about social media and WhatsApp groups. Should we go with Dragana first and then go back to you, Bridget, then? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead, Dragana. Thanks, Bridget. Sorry, for some reason I can't see the hand motion. <laughs> it's a very interesting reflection on uh, belonging, Katie. Uh, and I was wondering, in um, all of the uh, research that, that uh, you, uh, you've done, uh, the students have done, um, is there uh, much talk on, um, the yes, feeling visible and acknowledged in matters? Is there some sense that we could somehow measure these things, uh, uh, again, in terms of... <sighs> the quality of the network um, and um, the, the degree to which you trust to each other and depend on uh, each other and how you relate and connect so that the functioning of the network that you belong to um, and, and have you uh, done much of that in your research? This is to all the presenters. Do they want to kick us off? I, I don't mind going first. Um, this is something actually that we thought quite a bit about um, when we were deciding on our interview set schedule and what we would ask young adults in our qualitative study, because typically you'd expect young adults to developmentally, I suppose, to need a big, large group of people or, you know, many friends, many connections. But then we thought about how important are the quality of those connections for loneliness in young adults. So we asked young adults um, in our study um, can't remember the exact phrasing, but basically, do you think it's more important to have one good person or to have a large group of many connections or which do you think might be more um, important for young adults? And we got quite mixed answers, but what a lot of people said um, is that one person will pull you out of loneliness or one person is enough to make you, uh, to help combat this really maybe chronic loneliness or bad loneliness. But that ideally you want more than one because they said that you know the burden on this one person of carrying a lot of if you have is like issues or if you want to talk to somebody about something and um, so that was kind of what a few people said is that one person can kind of one good quality person that you trust can help combat loneliness but that ideally you want more than one a group and a lot of people said a group of maybe four or five people that you're good friends with um so we now we haven't analyzed we have i haven't got teams or anything yet so it'll be interesting to see when we do analyze all of our interviews and um, in relation to that thank you emma any other responses to dragana's comment um i mean i, I can come in I, i'm i'm like not a measurement guy um but i think like um, anecdotally um with through the research really and, and a lot of the students I work with, um, I think there is a change in the relationships. When I was younger, you'd like to have like a big circle of friends and all, in that you might have a kind of a few closer friends. But I think now um, there's young people seem, you know, hyper aware of these kind of like gradations of, you know, where people sit. And there's a real sort of like, you know, I have these two people and I can really rely on them. And, and everyone else seems sometimes to be a bit of a risk. And that's what I've kind of like picked up. So I don't know if that's relevant. 
any other reflections? I mean, certainly for my study, um, we had a scale which was trust in teacher scale, which is trust in the practitioner. We, it was a dance class. So we were able to um, explore that trust. Um, we we're actually still under analysis as well. And my colleague was doing that. But I believe that we did find some um, elements of trust in teacher, which was quite interesting. So that's looking at the quality of relationships. We also use, it's like the iOS scale, which is like self and other scale. And you have these different circles. I don't know if you've seen it, but the participant has to say what, which picture represents your sense of relationship to a group. So you've got self and other that are far apart and then the circles get closer and closer together. So that's quite a good one as well to kind of examine people's um, sense of meaning that they derive from the group. And then we've carried out interviews and focus groups as well and really I feel like that's the way to examine that complexity of that meaning and unpack the richness of somebody's subjective relation to the group itself and that combined with quantitative data gave us quite a rich, rich picture. Um, Helen. Um, yes, I, I just I, I think this is so interesting, but just from all of you presenters who are, you know, you've done all this empirical work, what do you feel is are the kinds of interventions in the chat there's been a little bit about um, sort of the built environment and trying to do something you know of course there's all the history of friendship benches all sorts of things that we can try and do but I just wondered from those of you who've actually done these studies so recently if you actually feel that university or, or work environments could any could do anything in the physical environment to uh, alleviate loneliness. I think Manal would be a good one for that. <laughs> so uh, some of my students uh, participants uh, said that having a microwave and a water boiler in a library or in their department was a really good idea because not all of them could afford having uh, tea and coffee, buying tea and coffee every day as they work. Microwave as well was another idea to save time and also to be part of the community. Coffee machines, uh, I know they are not about the space, but about the objects in the space. But this since uh, they got people together. So even if they didn't talk to anyone else in the room, they had uh, a physical connection to uh, the library or to the department building where they could eat there, have their coffee there and whatever they like there. So even if they weren't talk talking to people, they were comfortable. They were not anxious all the time, which is something that many university students feel constantly. So that's what, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manal. I think we are going to have to come to a close. If anyone has a very quick comment, there might be time. We've got like one minute. If, there, if anyone else has anything else to add to that. I mean, if I could, I, I think one of the things I don't like about the, the language of like interventions, and I think it kind of has this idea that we can kind of like tinker around the edge. I think one of the things that kind of I really thought was amazing about Manel's kind of um, idea is if you know, these big societal cultural things, you know, there, these are languages that don't have, um, you know, a language for loneliness. But I think, you know, what, what, what can we do? Fun cultural democracy. I think we need to kind of like make big demands of, of societal change. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of like legitimating, you know, these kind of like austerity based kind of like neoliberalizing processes, but also kind of like, you know, blaming people when these things don't work. I think. I think big demands for societal change is a really great place to end this um, session. So thank you so much for that powerful ending, um, James. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you all have. It's been wonderful to meet you all and fabulous presentations. I want to thank all of the speakers and everyone here for engaging in that rich discussion. I think it was a great um, session with you all. We're now going into lunch break, I believe. So please come back for 1.45 for a panel discussion on how to integrate psychological and social approaches to addressing loneliness and social isolation in the context of mental health. So please return to the main room, stay signed into Zoom if possible, but muted. That was fine, Ellie, but we're recording something now, but I don't know if it's the end of the breakout room. <laughs> If you just pause your recording, that should be fine. <laughs>